Anyway, so in the 1970s, there was a popular saying that says, if it feels good, do it. Today, we hear the, that same mentality expressed in sentiments like, what's truth for you may not be truth for me. That saying has so thoroughly saturated our culture that our top value as a nation is tolerance. Tolerance today means, doesn't necessarily mean that you accept another person for who they are. Today, tolerance means that you, you must affirm and endorse people's values and their behaviors as well, no matter how off-center they are. If not, you're a, you're a bigot or some other malicious creature. If Jesus' teachings would be judged by today's standards, he would be one of the most intolerant, politically incorrect, fundamentalist extremists that ever walked the face of the earth. Why? Because he taught that there are absolute standards of right and wrong. Today I want to explore what can happen if we don't stand for the truth, to see the consequences if we don't speak the truth, the consequences of Christian inactivity. Ezekiel 33, 6 says, If the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people, and the sword comes and takes someone's life, that person's life will be taken because of their sin, but I will hold the watchman accountable for their blood. Edmund Burke said, All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. The consequences of Christian inactivity are, first of all, anti-Christian laws and oppression. Habakkuk 1.4 says, Therefore the, the law is paralyzed, and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. I want you to imagine the following scenarios. You're at the grocery store, and you swatch your kid's hand. As a result, you're arrested and then put in jail for one year for spanking your child. See Assembly Bill 755, introduced in the California Assembly by Sally Lieber in 2007. Or what about this? A judge rules that homeschooling is illegal unless the parents are state-credentialed tutors. The state senators, they don't overthrow this unconstitutional ruling, and as a result, parents who refuse to send their kids to a state-approved school, they risk losing them to child protective services. Yet when you send your child to that very same state-approved school, another judge will say that your parental rights cease once your child enters through those school doors especially when it relates to sexual values and the teaching of homosexuality and other sexual matters. See Fields v. Palmdale School District Ruling, 2005. Or what about this one? The definition of gender is expanded to include uh, any gender an individual chooses for himself or herself. School kids are given the freedom to choose the girls' restroom or the boys' restroom, depending on whether they feel like they're uh, male or female that day. Those first two scenarios are based upon genuine, currently proposed laws originated by senators and representatives, and they're still waiting to be passed. The third scenario is the law. That's the California Gender Recognition Act. We've already seen real examples of people in the United States and Europe persecuted and suffering under such laws. Here in the still free United States, Christians have been thrown in jail for distributing Bibles on public property. They've been, they've been slapped with huge lawsuits. Churches and organiz, church, Christian organizations, they've had to spend millions of dollars on legal fees just to be able to build on their own property. And a preacher in Phoenix, Arizona, he was sentenced to jail for 10 days and got three years probation because a judge forbade their church bells to chime except for two minutes on Sundays. Those church bells were lower in volume than an ice cream truck, which is allowed to chime any time during daylight hours. In Alameda, California, in 2020, Superior Court Judge Frank Roche, he yelled at parents who sought to excuse their elementary school kids from a controversial pro-homosexual curriculum, forced on them by the school board. The judge called the parents bigots, and, and the decision was upheld. It was required for those young elementary school kids to attend those classes, despite a federal law that says it's ultimately up to the parents. Why weren't there any Christians on that school board? The Phoenix City Council took a guy named Michael Salmon from Phoenix, Arizona, to court. He took him to court for having a Bible study in his own home. And I want to read directly from the case here. 
In February 2007, plaintiffs were told by defendant councilman Clad Maddox that neighbors were concerned about plaintiffs' use of property. Plaintiffs attended a meeting with Maddox, their neighbors, and city officials. At the meeting, plaintiffs were told that pursuant to city ordinances and codes, religious activity within a residence is considered church use, which is not permitted on plaintiff's property without the necessary permits. Now, what I've just listed is really just the tip of the iceberg. You can go to frc.org. I put it in your bulletin. Uh, Family Research Council website. Just, just glance through those. And just briefly, just glance through them, and I want you to ask yourself, with changes like this, how much longer do you think Christian free speech and free worship will last? When will they come to arrest you for your Bible study? And before you say, oh, Dave, that's, that's overdramatic, let me tell you something. I go to preaching conventions every year. And every year, there are always several workshops at these seminars dedicated to these topics because all of these actions reflect a specific, strong, anti-Christian and anti-God bias by those in control. All of these unfair and un-American actions were taken by people that we Christians have the power to appoint or dismiss, to vote for or against. I think all of us can sense the growing unease in the direction that this country is headed. But let me ask you, what are you doing about it? Pew Research indicates that 65% of Americans claim to be Christian. Now, the key word there is claim, all right? But the real fact is, is there are over 60 million evangelicals in the United States. But the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University found that over 40 million Christians don't plan to vote. With up to 40 million Christians sitting on the sidelines, presidential and Senate races are are, are being won or lost by a few hundred thousand votes. The result of inactivity is anti-Christian laws and actions by those in power. The second thing I want to talk about is the temporal judgment of God on the nation. 2 Kings 17.1, Hoshea, son of Elah, became king of Israel and Samaria, and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 3, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up to attack Hoshea and seized him and put him in prison. Verse 5, the king of Assyria invaded the entire land, marched against Samaria, and laid siege to it for three years. Verse 7, all this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God. They they worshipped other gods while following the practices of the nations that the Lord had actually driven out before them, as well as the practices that the kings of Israel had introduced. With a final bloody push, the kings of Assyria brought their, their charioteers and their men to the heart of Israel. They camped right outside her walls. They'd already laid waste to every town in their path. God had allowed an evil king to come right to Jerusalem's door. And after spending 40 years in the wilderness, building up a a ragtag group of uh, cousins into a fighting force, some 800 years building the nation of Israel, 40 years building Solomon's kingdom into a, a rich and immensely influential empire, God sends the Assyrians to crush Israel. A few years later, he sends the Babylonians into the the lone surviving nation of Judah to destroy it and burn it to the ground. Why did God do this to his people? Weren't these his, his children, his chosen? Why did God abandon them like that? Why did he let them be so horribly treated and destroyed? Well, we know why, don't we? Quite simply, prior to most attacks and sieges, we see the Israelites abandoning God. It was primarily reflected in their abandoning his law, doing things like sacrificing their children and disobeying his guidelines. So he punished them because they turned away from him, because they abandoned his principles and did not fear him anymore. In fact, the history of Israel is littered with with stories of their abandoning God and being punished and for some reason never learning. But if you look at that passage again, you you notice that it wasn't just the people of Israel and Judah that turned away from God. It was their kings in particular. 2 Kings 17, 7 again. All this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God. In verse 8, and followed the practices that the kings of Israel had introduced. In other words, God punished the people 
because of their leaders who they followed. During these sieges and attacks, God obviously he saved a few people, you know, like the widow who helped Elisha in 2 Kings. But here's the real question. Did all the innocent people, that, that is all the people who still loved God, uh, did they get spared? We'd like to think so, but the Bible never says that they were saved. In fact, we know that the good were taken into exile along with the bad. For instance, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were all good men, but they were taken from their families. Women were, were raped and babies were killed. And we know those babies didn't disobey God. The good suffered along with the bad. The good experienced the terrible judgment of God just as the bad did. What's my point? My point is that when God judges a nation for the behavior of certain people in that nation or because of its leaders, you and I, the followers of Christ and our children, will also suffer the physical consequences. True, we may not personally suffer the spiritual consequences, although I believe you could make the case that our grandchildren may not only suffer the physical, but also the spiritual consequences. And you might be thinking, ah, that was, that was just for Israel, Dave. They were special. That is simply not true. We, we can see in the, the many historical accounts, like those of Daniel and the handwriting on the wall, where both Babylon and Assyria were also judged severely by God. Uh, remember Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria? Nineveh was destined to be destroyed, right? But when our people turned away from evil, they were spared. They were saved. None of those were godly or chosen nations. Were they special? Were they any more special than us here in America? If not, how much more will we be judged? Has God judged us in the past? Slavery was something that led to the American Civil War. Brother marched upon brother in a war that eventually took the lives of 620,000 Americans. And not only did the unjust die, but in tragic consequences, the just and the merciful also paid the price for those years of sin. I can't with any authority sit here and point to specific wars or natural calamities of, as judgments of God, but we can certainly raise the question and suggest that America paid a price for slavery and paid that price in blood. Not only that, but the cost of the war and its destruction it was so great that any financial benefits that those years of slavery may have brought, they were erased. In, the, in those years of destruction and reconstruction, almost every slave owner went bankrupt. The economy of the South was systematically destroyed. In the end, nobody benefited from slavery. Everyone suffered, even the just. And in some ways, we're still experiencing the consequences of that sin, aren't we? So look around you. Look at the way this nation is acting. Do we deserve to be judged and punished? Of course we do. And, and many times God's judgments end up being the natural consequences of our own foolish decisions and immoral laws. God doesn't have to step forward and intervene with a lightning bolt or a flood in order for us to suffer. In fact, I would say that most of the time, He has to choose to actively protect us from the consequences of our own current foolishness. Ezra 9.13 says, What has happened to us is a result of our evil deeds and our great guilt. And yet, our God, you have punished us less than our sins deserved. It might not be God deciding to punish us as a nation, but rather just God just letting us learn our lessons through the school of hard knocks and allowing us to experience the consequences of our actions or inaction. Christians need to work to influence this culture, to change this culture, to permeate this culture, even if it's just for the sake of the unsaved people who have not yet had the, the message, the gospel message presented to them away in, in a way that it resonates with them. We have to change our nation, but we have to see it change not only from the bottom up with the people, but also from the top down and the leadership and the culture. What that means is that Christians have to be involved in its leadership and change its leadership. We have to be involved in its laws to change its laws. And we have to be involved in its culture to change its culture. If we don't, our children, the poor, the widows, the oppressed, they, they are all doomed to suffer the consequences of our inactivity. 
If you care about the weak and the oppressed and bad political policies that create more suffering, I want you to notice that God has placed you in a country where you can actually glorify him by doing something about it. So take advantage of that. It was in the lifetime of Jeremiah the prophet that that God's people were carried off as captives into Babylon. And for those of you saying this morning, I I just don't want to get involved. I, I, I don't want to get involved. I want you to to listen to what God instructed those exiles to do that he sent into Babylon and this new country they now inhabited. This is Jeremiah 29, 7. And work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. This is the country that we live in. We are to work for the the peace and prosperity of our country, the United States of America. Pray for it and work for it. We have a vested interest in what happens in this country because its welfare determines our welfare on so many levels. It is our duty as Christians to at least try to ensure that the natural or supernatural judgment of God does not fall upon our people. Shouldn't we be involved in the moral direction that this country is going? Can someone please tell me when did that stop being our role? If we can influence a politician, or better yet, encourage our fellow Christians to be those politicians, could we not affect positive change and perhaps delay the judgment of God? And it's not an either-or choice here. It's not either you preach the gospel and make disciples or you become the salt of the earth and the light of the world to influence the culture. It is both. The last thing I want to talk about this morning is a turning from spiritual darkness. John 3.19. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Romans 1.21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Because a nation's laws are a reflection of its morality, those laws have spiritual consequences. Sometimes you'll hear people say that laws don't change hearts. The idea is that we shouldn't focus on on changing the laws because that doesn't work. Instead, we should just witness the people, and and Christ will change their hearts. We just need to go and preach the gospel. And then over time, we'll see some social change and social justice, but is it true that laws don't change hearts? I don't think so. I'm not talking about changing your, your heart to accept Christ. I'm talking about if laws can actually influence your views and change your beliefs and then bring about behavioral social change. You know, years ago, cultural and ethnic separation and, and even racism were the norm here in the United States. They, they thought they were making efforts to change for the good. At the time, young kids, they were born into a system of laws and regulations that actually encouraged separation. So that our young children grew up to believe that racism or separation was actually acceptable or at the minimum a necessary evil. But then the civil rights movement came along and it started to gain momentum. And finally, the legislature was convicted or replaced and the laws were changed. As a result, almost all kids grow up today observing and believing in the new laws and values. It's wrong, it's immoral and wicked to discriminate based on race. In fact, the laws of the land is so prevalent that even in families where the parents might be racist, the kids frequently will still grow up rightfully believing that racism is wrong. Why? Because they had grown up under the new civil rights laws. I'm I'm one of them. My mother was one of the most racist people that I ever knew. And, And I just could never understand why you would hate someone that you didn't even know, had never even had a conversation with, just because they weren't the same color as you. I never understood that. Or consider what Scott Klusendorf, a globally recognized speaker on ethics, says. The purpose of the law is not to change hearts, though it often does just that, but to restrain evil acts by heartless individuals. It is simply false to say that laws cannot change 
public behavior, and public opinion. As history shows, the law is a moral teacher that can help change our hearts. Prior to the 1964 Civil Rights Act, popular opinion in the southern states overwhelmingly opposed desegregation and anti-discrimination efforts. But within five years of passage, public opinion had shifted dramatically with better than 60% favoring the new laws. Again, the law served as a moral teacher that helped mold public opinion. I think, remember the Titans back when Disney was still good, gave the best visual portrayal of that shift taking place. In February 2006, Britney Spears, the troubled pop singer, she was on the front page of every magazine and newspaper. Her crime? Holding her child in her lap while she was driving. Everyone was like, how could a good mother do that? That's abuse. Someone should take her kids from her. Yet if you stop and think about this, just a few years earlier, Everyone carried their their babies in their laps while they were driving. Car seats were available everywhere, right? But there wasn't a car seat law back then. How else was mom supposed to get to the grocery store? Myself, my brother, my sister, we were stuck in milk crates on a a one-person moped, and those red milk crates were bungee corded onto uh, the moped so that we could get to the grocery store and back. And we fell a lot. No seat belts, just bungee cords. I think, I think everyone must have just assumed we were practicing for the Ringling Brothers or something. I don't know. But the point is, nobody would have cared if Britney had done this back then. In fact, they might have even admired her, you know, uh, for wanting to spend extra time with her kid, even though she's a busy pop star. So, so here's a law that once it was in the books, it not only changed our children's hearts, but it also changed many adults' hearts. And get this, it did it in less than 15 years. People's moral attitudes had changed. Society had changed. Behaviors had changed. My point is that laws do change hearts. And while in some cases it may not change your heart, it sure will change the hearts of our children and their children and beyond. The law may not change the hearts of the ones under whom it was first legislated, but it will certainly change the hearts of the ones that grow up knowing only it. And that works both ways, guys. Just as a good law can change the hearts of kids who grow up under it to do good, a bad law, it can change the hearts of the generations of elementary school kids today towards immorality. As the courts overturn those laws to find the will of the people, many of our own children, despite what we tell them that God says, And despite the values that this country was built on, no matter what the physical and statistical evidence says, they will reject the moral laws of God. And their innocent little hearts will be molded and corrupted by immoral laws of the land. They will come to believe in, embrace, and celebrate things like gender confusion. And some of the statistics indicate that to assume that Gender is meaningless. Many of them will ignore the fact that the law given by God was given for our safety and our health. So we have to ask, are we going to sit by and let an immoral concept become the law of our land? Are we going to let our children be brainwashed by bad laws? The laws and the lawmakers that are put in place today will impact your children your neighbor's children, your your, your children's children. But let's go one step further. I talked about what happens when God judges a nation. If we allow the the laws to change in such a way that they turn people's hearts and and values away from God, we will, beyond any shadow of a doubt, end up losing the right to preach the gospel. And don't think that this is alarmist or unlikely. It's already happening with hate speech laws. and the fluidity of what hate speech actually is. In Key Largo, Florida, two Gideons were arrested and jailed for handing out Bibles on a public sidewalk, for handing out what is quickly becoming hate speech. If the culture changes enough and, and they start to come for us, they'll start with the preachers first. I had to consider the fact that Facebook may take this down. I don't think I've said anything incredibly inflammatory, so I think we're probably still good. 
But don't be fooled into thinking that this will never happen. I bet they never thought it would happen in Germany, the, the land of the Protestant Reformation either. If we lose the right to preach the gospel in the United States, do you not think it'll have spiritual consequences on the millions of kids who will be pre- prevented from hearing the good news? Do you not think it'll have spiritual consequences on the billions of people around the rest of the world like those who currently have American Christians and American Christian churches funding their outreaches and compassion ministries like we do? Sure, the Word of God will still go forward, but bad American laws may have the effect of condemning billions around the world by restricting the the proclamation of the gospel and restricting compassionate outreaches to the oppressed and to the poor. And I get it. I get it. Christians are tired of fighting the culture war here in the United States. We're tired of being called homophobes and racists and sexists and bigots. So we just kind of we just kind of go downstream, you know, and we do our work down here downstream, forgetting that the first rule of life on the riverbank is any good that someone does downstream is quickly overtaken by what happens upstream. All of our elite cultural institutions laugh at virginity and they celebrate promiscuity. The virus of of spiritual bankruptcy and moral decadence spread by so many Hollywood movies infects our culture. America is the most consequential nation on earth. And And right now it is in desperate need of God at the moment. If America falls, it'll be a thousand years of darkness for the entire planet. Today's Christians are aces at sacrifice. We are amazing at serving others, but strangely timid for a people who've been given eternal life. We need to buck up and serve our country and remind ourselves every day of Christ's words. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. You see, when the church in Jerusalem came under attack, they fled the city and they preached wherever they went. But if America falls, there's nowhere else to run. So what can you do about it? Make sure your voice is heard this week and beyond. If you are here today, I know today was kind of a heavy topic. We've got a big week ahead of us, but I think we need to take the time that maybe today you've been just kind of wandering around. You're not really affiliated with any Christian ideologies. I want to invite you to make that decision today to become part of a bigger church family, become part of what should be moving this country in the right direction. We need to lead the way, and you can be a part of that if you give your life to Christ. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Dear God, Lord, we come before you now humbly as your servants, and we ask for guidance, God. We live in a, in a dark world, and it's, it's a confusing place to be. But it doesn't have to be, God. Help us to look to you for guidance. Help us to look to you for strength, to be our light, to guide us through this dark and sometimes very difficult world. Lord, I pray for this country and what this week means for this country. I pray that we would all come to you, talk to you, Ask for your guidance and make the right decision. We love you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.